please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. On the show today, Abhay and Rishabh are in the mood for some Harley Davidson cruise experience. So off they go on a long ride. Rohit finds himself behind the wheel of the all-new Nissan Leaf. Shumi answers all of your motor inquiries on Auto Selector, and we check out the latest launch from this week. Hi, welcome to Overdrive. You're watching the show with me, so I need that. Now earlier this week, I happened to chance upon a very funny conversation between Abhay Varma, road test editor, as well as Rishabh Bhaskar. Now, Rishabh, of course, is one of those team members who enjoys food just as much as the next person, and he was craving strawberry and cream, some authentic strawberry and cream, rather, which you only get in the hills of Panchkani. So Abhay Varma decided that he would treat him to that strawberry and cream if only Rishabh promised to go with him on a long drive to test two of Harley Davidson's latest adventure tourers. Now Rishabh, of course, loves motorcycles just as much as he loves a good dessert. So off they went, and here's their story. When Shumi came back from Spain after riding the 2018 Harley Davidson Soft Tails, he didn't stop talking about how the bikes are lighter, more powerful, and they're so much more fun to ride. I'm finally getting to ride two of the 2018 Soft Tails, the new Fat Boy and the Fat Bob, right here in India. And what better way to experience them than take them for a long ride? So I've got Rishabh with me, and we are heading to Mahabaleshwar, which is a hill station about 250 kilometers south of Mumbai. The Fat Boy and Fat Bob are two of the many motorcycles Harley Davidson updated last year. Interestingly, this is the first model change both motorcycles are seeing in a very long time, and pretty much everything is new. So apart from looking a lot more modern, the Fat Boy and Fat Bob both get a bigger, more powerful engine that sits in a completely new, lighter and more rigid chassis. The suspension is new as well, and both motorcycles have lost weight too. All this clearly tells us that Harley Davidson has focused extensively on improving the dynamics of both motorcycles. But before you even swing a leg over, the styling is sure to make you want to pause and admire their looks. The bigger highlight though is the design change on these two motorcycles. Well, the previous generation Fat Boy, it was my favorite Harley Davidson. And I don't think I need to tell you how cool it looked in Terminator 2, where Arnold Schwarzenegger famously rode that motorcycle. And this one looks so much better, so much more modern and futuristic, especially with that headlight. I'm sure that if there's another Terminator sequel coming, Arnold is certainly going to ride this motorcycle in that. For 2018, the Fat Boy has been transformed into a very futuristic looking Harley, while not giving up its traditional look. So you get this gorgeous looking full LED headlight, along with a large LED ring as the daytime running lamp. The headlamp unit, fat sleeves for the front forks and solid alloy wheels make for a very distinctive looking front end. And this is a fat boy, so you get a really fat 160 section front tyre and a massive 240 section rear tyre. The wide handlebar and teardrop shaped fuel tank are of course a nod to the previous fat boy and look as good as ever. The satin finish on the engine and exhaust looks excellent and I was really impressed with the overall finish levels as well. I was not a huge fan of the previous generation Fat Bob's design. I think those twin round headlamps looked outdated. But the new one, this bike looks so mean. I mean just look at that headlight. I think it looks so good I'm almost tempted to say it looks better than the new Fat Boy. If the new Fat Boy looks futuristic, the Fat Bob's headlight looks out of this world. This is a design unlike any other motorcycle, and while the previous Fat Bob looked like a traditional cruiser, the new one is sportier than every other Harley Davidson. Credit that to the flat, drag-style handlebar, the tightly packaged engine, and the upswept twin exhausts. The Fat Bob also gets twin discs up front that not only do a better job of braking, but also add to its sporty looks. The riding position is more upright than the Fat Boy, and the ground clearance is higher, which adds to its sportiness as well. Move to the rear and you will probably think the tail light has fallen off but this is how Harley has designed the rear end to offer the distinctive garage built look and the tail lights are integrated into the turn indicator pods. Common to both motorcycles is Harley Davidson's new Milwaukee 8107 engine. It displaces 107 cubic inches or 1745 cubic centimeters. It produces 145 newton meters of torque which is up from 132 nm that the earlier engine offered. But more importantly, 
The engine architecture is a lot more modern now, which is why the engines are smoother than before, because Harley says it has worked extensively on reducing internal friction. Harley Davidson's previous engines were smooth, but the new Milwaukee 8107 on both bikes here feels a lot smoother. Of course, the improved performance means acceleration is quicker as well, and among the two, it is a fat bob that feels punchier and is quicker to take off from standstill or accelerate out of corners. Like before, one of the biggest draws on both bikes though is the exhaust note. Harley Davidson has managed to retain the characteristic V2 in rumble the brand is known for, something that's sure to appeal to purists. The ride from Mumbai to Mahabaleshwar is a quick run across National Highway No. 4, but of course, it passes through a few hills as well. So in effect, this ride has not only let us test these motorcycles at 100 kmph in 6 gear on open highways, it has also allowed us to experience the handling potential that the new Fat Boy and the Fat Bob offer. And I have to say, I am impressed at how much better the handling is. When it comes to cruising on highways, there aren't many motorcycles that can match the Harley Davidson experience. The Fat Boy's low saddle height and more relaxed riding position, where you stretch your legs forward and place your feet on footboards, makes it more comfortable on the highway, coupled with its wide, low-set handlebar. The Fat Boy has always been considered one of the best cruisers, and the new one is certainly poised to take that legacy forward. All that comfort though means the Fat Boy is lazier than the Fat Bob around corners, as its laid-back stance and wide front tyre rob it of an agile feel, and the Fat Boy also calls for more effort to manoeuvre at slow speeds. In the hills, it is the Fat Bob that is the sporty of the two to ride though, and that's thanks to its sharper steering geometry and of course the shorter handlebar that offers better leverage. So Rishabh, how are you liking the Fat Bob? I am enjoying myself, frankly. Uh, the ground clearance is higher on the Fat Bob, the uh, foot pegs are higher too, and uh, if you see the tyres, they're rounded as well. So that helps you tip the bike into the corner with a lot of more ease compared to the Fat Boy. And I think that's why I was enjoying myself. Uh, can we swap bikes now? Okay, fine, you can go for it. <laughs> Around corners, the Fat Bob instantly felt a lot more agile and sportier to ride. Its sharper rake, shorter wheelbase and stiffer upside-down Showa cartridge forks meant turning into corners was fun, but the bigger joy was its ability to lean deep into corners. The Fat Bob's foot pegs are positioned higher than the Fat Boy's footboards and grounding them is not too easy. So the new Fat Bob is thus a far more accomplished corner cover, if you can call a Harley that. The Fat Boy and Fat Bob both also get this remote preload adjuster knob for the rear suspension and while the setup is stiffer, both were able to soak up bumps and potholes reasonably well. I have to say, the new Fat Boy and Fat Bob both impressed me with their handling and despite their 300kg curb weights, both will surprise you with their agility. So we have reached Mahabaleshwar and it's been a fantastic day on the road with these two Harley Davidsons, the Fat Boy and the Fat Bob. And uh, I think the weather is cooler here which is making us feel good after this long ride. And it's now time for us to enjoy some strawberry with cream. But Rishabh, wait, before you dig in, what did you think of the two <laughs> motorcycles? Um, okay, I have to start with the Fat Boy first. Um, in terms of looks uh, or presence, it is absolutely stunning if you want a harley davidson that stands out and if you want people to look at you just look at the fat boy uh, those wheels uh, or you say the bling around the chrome or the shape of the headlamps drls it's just stunning and uh, what i also appreciate is the fit and finish it's it's much better than harley davidson's of uh, your and i think uh, it's a marked improvement um, but uh, so i did enjoy riding it on the highway but when i was riding up towards Mahableshwar. Um, in the hills? Yeah, in the hills. I, I didn't really like it. It di doesn't want to corner the tyre. If you see, the rear tyre is a bit flat. So Of course, it's got a 160 yeah. section front tyre. And a 240 rear, yeah. So, it's, it's a, you have to really, really muscle that uh, bike around corners and you got to have arms like Arnie. <laughs> we have to really <laughs> right. uh, get this bike going around corners. On the other hand, the Fat Bob is one that I really, really loved a lot. Uh, it's nimble, it's agile. I know I'm talking about Harley Davidson here, but uh, <laughs> yes. you don't feel its weight, first of all. And uh, the way it changes direction or, you know, the way 
it just feels to write it, it feels much more sprightly much more sportier i know that was the intent uh, and i think harry davison has really managed to do that and personally i really love the headlamps i think i'm just floored by the headlamps here yeah. so i think yeah the fat bob is the one that's right rishab i think uh, as far as the cruiser space is concerned these two motorcycles here have clearly up the game uh, of course they look a lot more modern and a lot more appealing the fit finish levels are way better than what we've seen on the previous generation models of uh, these two and apart from that i think what is more important to me and of course to you and most bikers is the fact that they are so much more fun to ride now they've yeah. got bigger engines the chassis is stiffer the suspension is stiffer which makes them so much more easy and fun to ride and engaging exactly and uh, the bigger news though is that they're still on sale as ckd the prices haven't changed so that makes them very attractive for somebody who's into cruising or riding distances so rishab uh, which one are you going to ride back home fat bob I think I'm happy I'll take the fat boy. Time for us to take our first break here on the show but coming up on the other side our overdrive editor Shumi will answer all of your queries on auto selector. Welcome back you're watching Overdrive and you've joined us on our auto selector segment here on the show where our overdrive editor Shumi will join us. Hi Shumi, our first question this week comes in from Suraj Nambiar. He writes in saying that he's planning to buy an SUV and his budget is under 30 lakh rupees. Preferably he would like a 7 seater and his priorities are good handling, refinement, good comfort and low maintenance. He would also like some clarity uh, about uh, the BS6 norms with 2020 looming up ahead. He wants to know if the BS6 norms would impact his present choice of vehicle. Suraj and all of our viewers, let's be clear when an emission norm comes into the future it doesn't affect any existing cars so when in 2020 all cars go bs6 everything new that is on sale must be bs6 it doesn't affect what you own already at all until the government implements a policy there is stock but there is still no law where a 15 year old private car will have to be retired if it cannot meet basic road worthiness requirements until that time existing cars can operate freely there is no impact at all from future emissions so if you want to buy a car today don't worry about 2020 just go ahead and buy what you like now that's where your problems begin because at 30 lakh rupees honestly there are no real 7 seater SUVs that either much below or much higher because the fortuner and the endeavor the two SUVs that you're looking at they're both about 35 lakh rupees now they're not in your budget so option 1 you stretch your budget option 2 find a used one uh, at 30 odd lakh rupees you should be able to find a really well kept one with very very few miles on the clock it's a good choice to take your third option is to forego the idea of an SUV buy an Innova Crysta instead it will seat 7 it's utterly reliable uh, very very luxurious fits in your budget it is a 7 seater it's just not an SUV Our final question this week comes in from Rajendra Kumdekar. He writes in saying that he is planning to buy a hatchback and has a budget of 8 to 8.5 lakh rupees. He has shortlisted the manual petrol versions of the Hyundai i20, the Suzuki Baleno. Uh, his monthly commute will be around 500 kilometers. What car would you suggest? Rajendra, the choice between the i20 and the Baleno is a choice about your temperament. If you like driving your cars and enjoy that part of the driving experience must get a bolino it's a driver's car in that sense comparatively of these two if you want everything else that's comfort features and all of those things the i20 is perhaps a slightly better bet but they're very closely matched cars you can't go wrong go test drive them get a sense of the car and drive the one that feels better out of the showroom to me if you like driving it's the bolino if you want the features the comfort and all of that is the hyundai But keep those questions coming to help desk at overdrive.co.in that is our email address you can also send them to us via facebook or twitter and we will get you me to answer them for you on the show right now though it's time for us to check out the latest launch from this week The all new LS luxury sedan from Lexus has made its way into India starting at 1.77 crore rupees going up to 1.82 crores for the distinct grande trim. The LS 500 is the flag bearer for Lexus's hybrid initiative in India. It employs hybrid system comprising of a 3.5 liter V6 petrol engine mated to two electric motors for a combined system output of 355 PS. Lexus claims a 0 to 100 km per hour sprint time of 5.4 seconds. The LS 500h goes on sale in India via Lexus's four dealerships based in Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai and Bangalore. Things in the mid-size luxury SUV segment are clearly heating up once again and Audi have launched a second generation Q5 hoping to battle this competition. 
Priced at 53.35 lakh rupees X showroom, this SUV gets a 2-litre diesel motor, but Audi has plans to introduce a petrol and a bigger diesel engine too. Made it to a 7-speed S-Tronic dual-clutch gearbox, it claims to return 17.1 km to the litre and comes with Audi Drive Select that includes driving modes like Dynamic, Auto, Comfort, Individual and Off-Road. The Q5 will compete with the new generation Volvo XC60 and the Lexus NX300H that have recently been launched and also the all-new BMW X3 which will be launched at the 2018 Auto Expo. Well then, it's time for us to take our final break here on the show but coming up on the other side, we will bring you a first look at the all-new Nissan Leaf. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. Now, the Nissan Leaf is one of the most popular electric vehicles in the world and their biggest market, of course, is the United States of America which is where Nissan took us to sample the all-new Leaf. Take a look. When electric cars became the foreseeable future of sustainable mobility, the Nissan LEAF debuted in 2010 as the car maker's first all-electric car. Years later, the LEAF has entered the second generation. The United States also happens to be one of the most successful markets for the LEAF and therefore it is no surprise that Nissan invited us to Las Vegas to sample their all-new EV. Nissan claims that the LEAF is the most successful electric vehicle of all time having sold more than 283,000 units in the last eight years. The new one builds on that success and even retains the chassis from the original Leaf. Why, you ask? Well, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Sharing the platform with an outgoing model does come with its restrictions on the exterior and interior designs. But Nissan has masked the challenges quite well and I like the way things have panned out. What I love about the Leaf's cabin is that unlike some of the other futuristic vehicles it doesn't try too hard to look futuristic it still feels like a conventional vehicle and i think that's a very good thing sharing the platform with the outgoing car has also saved nissan significant development costs and has allowed them to have a lower starting price for the new leaf the low cost itself was one of the biggest factors for the success of the first generation model the new one is following in its footsteps just right is the electrical system the same too well, pretty much. Just that the new lithium-ion batteries now have better energy density and are less sensitive to extremely cold or hot weather. The weather sensitivity was one of the primary reasons why the first generation LEAF wasn't considered for the Indian market and the new batteries should hopefully solve that problem. The drivetrain sees an improvement too with improved energy efficiency, 26% more torque and a 38% bump in the power output. Despite the higher power and torque output though, the improved batteries now extend the driving range of the LEAF. So how many variants will the Nissan LEAF spawn? At the moment, there's only one variant with different trim levels to choose from. Nissan will offer a larger battery pack to give you better range. And then we've also seen the LEAF GT and the LEAF Nismo concepts at the Tokyo Motor Show last year, which means there is a ray of hope for more fun vehicles in the LEAF lineup. Nissan is also calling the LEAF the most advanced electric vehicle in mass production and those bragging rights come courtesy of semi-autonomous driving technologies like the ProPilot and the ProPilot Parking, while advanced vehicle-to-grid capabilities make the LEAF more socially responsible too. The ProPilot Assist is essentially a radar and camera guided system that can help the LEAF autonomously maintain its lane and speed and alter the steering, acceleration and deceleration parameters depending on the lane markings and the behavior of the car in front of it. The ProPilot Parking Assist, on the other hand, controls the same parameters to autonomously park the car. Now, automatic vehicles, they made us go from three pedals to two, and now the LEAF brings it down to one. They're calling it the e-pedal technology. Let's see how that works. The concept of the e-pedal is simple. Dab the accelerator pedal and there'll be forward motion. Lift off and the computers will automatically activate regenerative braking to shave off speed in a quick yet linear manner. Feather the throttle and you will be able to coast peacefully with the leaf. I think the e-pedal technology works great. It's just a push of a button to engage it 
It's a very short learning curve and something that's very useful when you're driving in the city. But every now and then, you might have to use the conventional brake pedal just in case it doesn't work. While the chassis is largely similar to the outgoing Leaf, it does receive updates for better rigidity. The suspension has been worked on too to give the Leaf improved driving dynamics, a flatter ride through corners and a cushy ride over bumps. We couldn't verify either on our brief test ride. But the highway run around Vegas had us believe that the Leaf rides and drives like a full-size premium hatchback and the typical road and suspension noises prevent the cabin from being spooky quiet like a premium EV. In that sense, it feels just as normal as any other premium hatch out there, minus the guilt of the CO2 emissions and the burden of a hefty price tag. The latter, however, could change on its journey to India, as the CBU route will enforce taxes that could prevent it from being a value-for-money product. How Nissan India manages to overcome that hurdle remains to be seen. But for those looking to migrate to zero emissions motoring, the LEAF is worth looking forward to. Now we expect the Nissan LEAF to hit our Indian shows by the end of this year but we'll just have to wait and see just which autonomous driving technologies comes along with the car. Time then for us to wrap up this week's episode of Overdrive but remember you can stay in touch with the team through Facebook, Twitter, YouTube as well as Instagram and uh, we'll see you next week. Until then goodbye and many thanks for watching.